Hello, this is Chrononauts. We are a science fiction literature history podcast, and this month we're discussing Amazing Stories, the first American science fiction pulp magazine. And if you're curious about some of the background of this magazine, we recommend that you listen to the first installment of the episode, that is 31.1, where you will hear about where Amazing came from, how it got started, and some of the history of the magazine. Now it's my turn to talk about a real pioneer in American science fiction. Now, when I say that this guy is a landmark in terms of our episodes, I mean this in several different ways. I'm not just going to say he's the first of many things, but there will be some of that. And of course, we know we know how it is, and we've discussed this before. Every time you think you're the first of something, you find that, in fact, somebody got there before you. And this is even a comment that fellow space opera founder Edmund Hamilton made. Maybe I'll quote him at a later time when we actually come to discuss Edmund Hamilton. But I found that really interesting that he kind of noted that. It's a really fun way to put it as well. But this is a guy who began his writing career in 1928. We've done stories from the 20s. We've done stories from the 30s. We've even done a few from the 40s. We haven't gone past that point yet in the podcast. Trust me, we will. Oh yes, we will. This guy, though, Jack Williamson, was writing science fiction until 2005, the year before his death, when he was 98 years old. And... This feels really incredible at this point, getting here. I don't know if I can really illustrate that enough. It really feels like we've crossed a watershed. And i got a lot to say about Mr. John Stuart Williamson, whose family seems to trace itself back to early Scottish settlers in America in the 1600s. At least his father's side. We'll talk about his mother a little bit more shortly, but... The family were farmers and laborers who had been steadily moving south and into the west. Jack tells of his ancestors and their backgrounds, their hard lives and tribulations on the frontier. Now, I just want to pause for a moment and say that for the most part, and this is again a rare thing on the Chrononauts podcast, I can't think of that many instances where we've really looked at this. And I know, I mean, we had some opportunities in the past when we discussed Niels Klim by Holberg or Hol Holmberg. I always get those two mixed up. Yeah. The, the Argentinian and the Dane. Right. But, One has the L and... Yeah. The... So Holmberg had an autobiography of sorts or a memoir of some kind. And I, I admit that I didn't really look into that too much. But for the most part, a lot of the material we've been reading for background on these authors is sort of secondhand other people talking about them. Although I did find a few interesting things. A lot of what I'm going to say about Jack Williamson from this point on actually comes from the man himself. And it's from his own observations and his own recollections of experience and the way he's written it down. And you can really get a sense of somebody's personality that way. I mean, when we did the Skylar a couple episodes back, he was somebody that I sourced a lot from his autobiography for the background segment. Yeah, it's very different from a lot of the usual background sourcing. It's very, it feels more personal. It's it's not something that would have normally been my first choice, maybe. But like when it's there, I'm glad it's there. I mean, I'm glad that we had the guy who wrote The Beast of Bradhurst. Yeah, Skylar. Skylar, right. I'm glad we had his autobiography. Because that I found really interesting as well. Yeah. Even though it was a little bit towards the end there, just, just sort of obsessed with weird things and kind of, yeah, like, I mean, it's black and conservative. What, it, it was a strange experience reading that, but I found it really fascinating. This also, although his, I'm not sitting here to review his autobiography, I don't think it's one of the best autobiographies I've ever read, but I actually really found it interesting because he has a lot of, cool things to say about the genre, about science fiction, about other things that we'll get to as we go on. And maybe I will talk a little bit more about the autobiography too. But the name of that book is Wonder's Child. And if you want to find out about somebody who basically bridged the gap of the generations in science fiction from the early part of the 20th century till basically 15 years ago, this guy is worth looking into. 
he's not necessarily a household name. He's never been as good a seller as Isaac Asimov or Robert Heinlein or anything like that. And he knows this. And he's very, one thing that I thought was very disarming is that he's very humble about his own achievements. He comes across as this like sort of old school, southern, western gentleman, very open-minded. And kind of like a liberal, but in the sense of like a hundred years ago, I guess, obviously. And it makes sense. Mm. His father was born in Texas and had been intended by his family to join the ministry. So he attended a state college and in that happened to be fortunate to gain some really good teachers and learned much classical period erudition. And as a young man, traveled in the U.S. and Mexico. He was always a little bit uncertain about his religion and not he was kind of devout but very sarcastic almost. It was kind of a weird experience the way Williamson talks about him. So he decided to be a farmer instead of a minister and he sometimes took jobs at local schools and he apparently particularly enjoyed working in so-called problem areas where there were a lot of it was a lot of crime and a lot of people who lived really rough and he always used to tell stories about having to separate kids with knives and stuff like that. It sounds pretty hardcore really. Yeah. So his mother came from a somewhat proud southern family which was ill prepared to meet life after the civil war. Jack talks about how his mother's family had embraced slavery before the war and how he had to try to sort of understand that and he he never really could and he was always kind of like obviously something that made him quite uncomfortable and i think he made a point to sort of see the world and try to learn things about people and not be a victim of prejudice so jack was born in bisbee arizona in 1908 but the family men ended up moving to mexico when jack was only six weeks old and this is where jack spent the early part of his childhood on a ranch in the Sierra Madre. While the frontier in the States was fading, things were much rougher south of the border, Jack says. The Mexican ranching life didn't last long, though. Jack's father pulled up and moved the family again once the revolution broke out in 1911. The family lived in Texas for a while, where his father's farming investment went bad. And Jack lived in eastern New Mexico and continued to make this area his home through his law life. So, again, I want to point out how different this guy's life experience is from, like, 90% of the writers that we have on the podcast. Yeah. Very, very different. He sounds like he could be a character in a Willa Cather novel. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. almost. Mm. <laughs> Interesting way, well, yeah. Jack has a vivid memory of the family riding by a covered wagon to New Mexico and a new homestead near his father's brothers, his uncles, in 1915. By this time, they were very short of funds. Nevertheless, Jack seems to have been fascinated by the frontiers through his life, both physical and intellectual, and scientific, literary as well. His mother used to read stories to the kids, and early on he learned to lose himself in the pages of a book. Particularly a story of adventure. Early on, he remembers finding a copy of Bulwer Lytton's Coming Race in the library, a book we have covered on the Chrononauts podcast, as well as A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, a book we will cover on the Chrononauts podcast, and being lent Tarzan of the Apes by Edgar Rice Burroughs. He cites many other examples of stories he liked. He would seem to be an ideal target for Hugo Gernsback and Amazing, too, building a crystal set in 1922 and reading many of the popular electric magazines. Jack bounced around odd jobs, and when he was 17, he got it into his head that he liked to write. His first submissions were rejects at places like Triple X Western Magazine. <laughs> wonder what that was like. I mean, it's probably not what they meant back then, but... Uh... So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Then in 1926, Amazing launched. Williamson first heard about it from his friend, a so-called ham, a radio guy, who lent him a copy of one of the early issues. 
one which happened to contain Garrett Services' The Second Deluge. So he sent in a request for a free sample that he saw advertising a farm paper. And this was the March 1927 issue. Though he admits the cover artist, Frank Paul, wasn't very good at drawing people. <laughs> he enjoyed the covers. Yeah, his people are really, like, strange looking. His gadgetry and, like, space stuff, I don't know, it's, it's cool, it's a little ugly, but yeah, his figures are really weird looking. Yeah, that's funny, that's exactly what he says. He says, he, he, he says that he wasn't very good at drawing people, but he enjoyed the covers with their starships and monsters and machines. And the cover for the March 1927 issue was for the story Green Splotches by T.S. Stribling. And it also included Under the Knife by H.G. Wells and People of the Pit by Abraham Merritt, which, by the way, is very, very much a weird fiction story. I haven't read that story. It's awesome. It's short. It's... Definitely more weird fiction than science fiction. It's horror, I guess, really, too, because it's like this guy's in the Arctic or something like that, and there's an expedition, and they find this guy crawling around, and he's been down in this evil pit with this race of the lost... It's kind of a lost race story, but it's like more really short and horrific and weird. Yeah, we'll have to work merit into the podcast in, in some way. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting that they published that in Amazing, because it's very much not a science fiction story, I would think. But Merit was popular, so yeah, right. it seems with a lot of the... <laughs> people liked the reprint. People really liked him, and uh, according to the, the letters as well, so I'm mm -hmm. sure yeah. they would have published a lot of different things that maybe they wouldn't from a different author that wasn't as well known. Definitely what sells is what pays the bills, and Gernsback wasn't too fond of doing that, so... <laughs> um. <laughs> well, I didn't really mention this last time. Several of the authors said that they had heard or they, they somebody looked into it and he was living a pretty lavish lifestyle, like, on the magazines and not paying any of them. And so people were getting really upset. And that, huh? That's something I'll get more into again as well. Yeah, it's interesting that Amazing during the 1970s kind of took a look back at its origins in some way about Gernsback as a business owner and... The whole bankruptcy suit. This is very interesting in a way because he's been out of the picture. I think he died in what sixty eight, something like that. This nineteen sixty sometime. Yeah, I can't remember, but he was long gone from amazing by then, right? Right, so, and I mean by that time gone. they were able to take like a look back at themselves and maybe realize that you know this is a history of science fiction warts and all, and that probably the influence that Amazing had had its upsides and its downsides of yeah. it being kind of overly focused on the scientific elements in favor of talented pro style. And I think in the 1970s, the editorial team of Amazing, which, you know, again, had cycled through several different iterations, but they kind of realized that. And mm -hmm. they had a much more, I guess, general worldview of the genre and a kind of a more analytical and critical approach to their history. Oh, yeah. Well, even in, I mean, all those guys are gone, right? Like, none of those guys were left, except people like Jack, really. Yeah. And he, in fact, wrote in in 1978 to talk about that. Right. But even by, like, 1930, when Gernsback was gone from Amazing Itself, even though his career in science fiction publishing and publishing in general did not stop, obviously, but even then... I don't think that the, the payments were not necessarily increased, but nobody complained after that about them being not prompt. And in fact, right. I mean, I'll get to it, but like a few years later, Williamson got involved in trying to get money out of Hugo because he was owed so much. Another magazine he was involved in by then, Wonder Stories. But early on, Merritt was Williamson's model. And he borrowed a typewriter from his uncle and spent all his spare time in the next year writing things to try on Gernsback. So I have my first quote from Jack here. He talks about the experience and his early feelings about Amazing. He says, Science was becoming more and more alluring to me, but I had no visible road toward any sort of scientific education. Launching Amazing, Hugo Gernsback opened dimensions of science that I had never even dreamed of. In my imagination, science had always been magic made real. The promise of unlimited wisdom and power that even I might hope to learn and use. 
distinctions between wisdom and knowledge had not begun to trouble me then. And science fiction, in quotes, far from being the trash most people took it for, was present science transformed into future prophecy. That was Gernsback's message. He used it to push his magazines. But I think he really believed it. To such kids as I was, it was dazing revelation. And that's how Jack describes this stuff. And don't worry, I have many more Jack quotes to give you guys. Yeah, and I think it's pretty clear from the get-go that Gernsback's influence is immediately felt. I mean, the magazine only started in 26, and this is 27 he's saying this and, and feeling this, so... I mean, I think that Williamson was definitely not the only one out there who is really taking this stuff to heart. Yeah, I'm going to get into that right now. So the first thing Jack wrote for Amazing was a guest editorial in the fall 1928 Amazing Quarterly. Now, I hope you guys will excuse me while I read a portion of his editorial contribution to the magazine. Jack himself would later admit that this was very hyperbolic and sort of way too gung-ho. <laughs> Science ever widens our conception of the material universe. We drift farther from the old idea of man as the chief end of creation. To the savage, the universe is his valley, with the heavens arching low overhead, and himself supreme. Science has found a million new worlds, and lost itself in them. Earth has become a cosmic moat, man, utterly ephemeral, and insignificant. Science and intelligence alone remain considerable quantities. Then, if the life of the Earth is the briefest instant in time, a question rises. Must man pass with the Earth, or will human intelligence rule on a new factor in the universe? The idea is stupendous. Science is the doorway to the future. Scientific fiction, the golden key. The chief function of scientific fiction is the creation of real pictures of new things, new ideas, and new machines. Scientific fiction is the product of the human imagination, guided by the suggestion of science. It takes the basis of science, considers all the clues that science has to offer, and then adds a thing that is alien to science. Imagination. It goes ahead and lights the way, and when science sees the things made real in the author's mind, it makes them real indeed. It deals only with that which it can see, or weigh, or measure, only with logical hypothesis, experiment, and influence, and calculation. Science fiction begins with the ending of science. The realization of science fiction is the proverbial. Science has made Hardly a single step that scientific fiction has not foretold. And science, in return, has disclosed a million new and startling facts to serve as wings for the scientific fiction author's brain. Scientific fiction takes a thousand accumulated facts and builds them into a real, impressive picture of ages past, whereby the future of the race may be foretold. It mounts a time machine and ventures through futurity, revealing the results of known conditions and tendencies. Science knows that life on other worlds is possible, but it remains for scientific fiction to make the vision real, and to suggest the space flyer to verify it. Then, science may build the flyer and see for itself the boundless energy of the atom, the fourth dimension, the sub-universe below and the super-universe above are scientific absurdities all until scientific fiction gives them reality. And science goes on with scientific fiction as the searchlight. Here is the picture, if we can but see it. A universe ruled by the human mind, a new golden age of fair cities, of new laws and new machines, of human capabilities undreamed of, of a civilization that has conquered matter and nature, distance and time, disease and death, a glorious picture of an empire that lies away and past a million flaming suns until it reaches the black infinity of unknown space and extends beyond. And it goes on for a little bit longer. Yeah, no, it's a pretty 
impressive and very, very youthful, enthusiastic yeah. Oh, yeah. vision of things. And just to think that he was thinking this and writing this in 1928 and at the very beginning of Amazing, but would also go on to see not only the moon landing, but the modern internet. You know, he could have, it's probably unlikely that he did, but download a Black Sabbath album from me off of Soulseek. <laughs> yeah, he probably downloaded uh, Ethel Waters' album or something like that. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but uh, he but, yeah. lived to see a lot of stuff. And thinking this this early on and having that kind of lifespan throughout the latter half of the 20th century and the early beginnings of the 21st century, technology has really progressed in a lot of ways that even some of the most visionary science fiction authors of the 1920s would have thought totally impossible or beyond human conception. Oh, yeah. And it's just pretty amazing how that has all unfolded. And a lot of other things didn't come to pass the way right. they might have hoped. Jack does talk about that uh, a fair bit, too. And we won't be getting into too much of that because that's, like, well after the time period of his story. But I will I will get a bit more into what happens afterwards, too. But he'd also written some letters. We'll get into the letters, too, at the end because we've been talking about some of the letters that the contributors wrote. And I think it's kind of kind of a little bit fun to save them for the end. He continued to participate in the community, beside the letters column itself, which printed addresses. Those were people passed addresses to one another. And this is how Jack got in contact with other space opera pioneer, who I've already mentioned, actually, Edmund Hamilton, who also has a connection with somebody else that we'll be covering next. Yes. From what I've been reading and i wouldn't have necessarily have like this is not something obviously i i wasn't born till 1980 i didn't read any of these magazines when they came about and sometimes it's hard to get a, a picture of the way things were but from the sense of it what i get is there are, are a few basic pioneers of what later much much later became known first possibly as an insult and then probably not a uh, space <laughs> opera right yeah <laughs> <laughs> and they are Edmund Hamilton, Jack Williamson, and E.E. E. Doc Smith. And maybe we could throw in Murray Weinster in there as well. Of those guys, Jack and Murray, and maybe to an extent Hamilton, sort of made the jump into more modern day science fiction, but never really lost that kind of the space opera kind of feeling and participated in at least the golden age, if not future generations. So Hamilton was also getting started around this time. His first submissions were to Weird Tales. And he was already sort of known as the Planet Wrecker. Now, along with the editorial, Jack had mailed his story, The Metal Man, to Gernsback. It was by no means his first attempt to submit a story. All the previous ones had been rejected. Though he did, apparently, get a couple of small items into one of Gernsback's other publications, The Joke Magazine. At any rate, he didn't hear anything back for quite a long time. And in the fall of 1928, Jack was away at school in Canyon, Texas, where his father had just gotten enough money to send him with his sister. It was on a newsstand there that he saw his metal man on the Frank R. Pohl cover for December 1928. Indeed, Williamson would keep publishing scientific fiction until around 2005, the year before his death. And I believe the name of his last book is The Stonehenge Gate. But in 1928 and 29, Williamson was studying chemistry and English at West Texas. He and his sister rented a small house and didn't have much money or resources. And he had optimism for a return from his editorial and story. But, well, he got $75 for the editorial, and of course the check was late in coming, only after several inquiries were made. And he had this idea that Gernsback would pay 10 cents a word, akin to the prize for the editorial. Now, $50, a dash of cold water, he wrote in his autobiography, but not cold enough to stop me. Early 1929, he mailed in another story. To Hugo. I got a personal response back saying that Gernsback was leaving amazing, but starting up science wonder stories. 
Now he was using the word science fiction to describe what the contents of this new mag would be. And he said he would take Jack's story, The Silver Sea, with him and pay at regular space rates, whatever that meant. What it meant was a quarter a cent a word, and Jack complained of Gernsback's unethical nature in his autobiography, for sure. But he says that at least since real professionals were above that sort of thing, Gernsback gave beginners like Jack a medium to write in. There wasn't much editorial work done on the actual stories, and the tales reached an audience that was, as we've seen, quite large, really, for such a magazine. Seems even Abraham Merritt was reading Amazing. Williamson got a nice letter from him praising his early stories, and the two of them even discussed collaborating on a serial to be pitched to Argosy, though this never came to pass. In the end, Jack Williamson was one of the people who, in 1934, got an attorney involved and basically forced Hugo to pay up. But back to the late 20s, Williamson continued to try to hit other magazines like Weird Tales and Argosy without success. By the time The Prince of Space was published in Amazing in January 1931, he'd already contributed a few stories to Astounding at better pay for two cents a word. And to put into perspective here, the slicks, so-called, were paying as much as a dollar a word in some cases. Actually, Williams had submitted Prince of Space to Astounding, but it got rejected. And the notice just said, Well stocked with longs, didn't make the grade. Thanks, Harry. <laughs> that would be Harry Bates, then editor of Astounding, most known today as the author of Farewell to the Master, which is the story that became The Day the Earth Stood Still. So Williamson spent most of 1932 traveling and writing, sometimes living pretty rough. As yet, he had no experience at all with sex or women in general, which is definitely, definitely going to come up in this talk. But he's very, very candid about that. I, I'm not, I don't, I, I can't be hard on him, not after... Not after this. <laughs> but he did end up returning to university and studying several courses. And one gets the idea sometimes that he did this mostly to further his writing. But he did this for a really long time. He became a hardcore academic, which is just really interesting considering how he started out. But by now he had gotten into weird tales and gotten to know many of its writers. He was also friends with Isaac Asimov by the late 30s. He was very, very young, obviously, at that time. Wide-eyed, young Asimov trying to get his early stories published. And they remained in touch for decades. In the 30s, Jack got to know the whole science fiction community in America. He was really the only sort of old generation writer to fall under John Campbell's spell and become part of the so-called Golden Age. Most of the others got their start around 1939 or the early 40s. And Williamson was starting to earn respect as a member of the previous generation, which is pretty cool. You know, you mentioned the Black Sabbath album earlier. I was going to comment. Rock music does come up in Jack's book. He talks about meeting Harlan Ellison at a science fiction writing gathering hosted by Damon Light. And what these guys would do would be they would get together for a whole week at some place. I forget where it was. I feel like it was kind of some remote, somewhere in Pennsylvania, maybe, or something like that. I don't know. Somebody will, I, I should have noted that down, but I wasn't really going to mention it. But you, you said Sabbath and I had to. So then <laughs> he talks about all the people he met. He was like meeting the new wave guys, meeting like the young generation, not just, not Asimov and stuff here, the generation on, but like, we're talking the late 60s, early right. 70s, right. like hanging out with Harlan Ellison. And he has something to say about Brian Alvis, actually, which is, yeah, who, who apparently he was friends with. But yeah, so, but he said that Harlan was the one that would bring his rock music. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of love the way he talks about the young generation. He's really like proud of them and he's really worried about them and he's like he calls the 60s generation the rebel generation but he's not like harsh about it he's not an old guy going oh these guys you know he, he talks about like the vandalism of university campuses and stuff but he's not like condemnatory about it he tries yeah. to be open-minded about it and 
we'll we'll get to some of the funny things later, but like this guy was basically a grandpa by the time he was he'd been writing for twenty years already, and he was like kind of this is a, an interesting character of a, of another time and another time really. So he also really got into psychoanalysis, and it seemed to help him with many of his personal inner conflicts, and even became in a way the basis for his werewolf novel darker than you think which is a book that sounds really interesting that I'd, I'd quite like to read actually but this is kind of interesting his his getting really involved in psychoanalysis because like he started believing that it could help him and later on john campbell who i'm sure we'll be talking a lot more about in some future episode or two or three got really into Dianetics. L. Ron Hubbard was a whole part of that school, and obviously we know that led to Scientology and stuff like that. And Campbell really got into Dianetics, and he was trying to convince Williamson that it would be a good idea for him to get audited, and it would really help him out. And Jack's just kind of like, yeah, no thanks, this is it's just really silly. and <laughs> He didn't want to have anything to do with it. So during World War II, though, he finally did get to work in science as a meteorologist. And forecaster. And like many of the writers of the time, his output definitely was curtailed during the war period. Jack married his old high school friend, Blanche, in 1947. And it's here that he sort of rediscovered his old roots and takes up in Portales, New Mexico. And this is where he pretty much spends the rest of his life. Although he does enjoy traveling a lot, apparently. So Blanche had already been married and had two children by this point, so Jack was a grandfather mere months after they got married. Williamson was well-liked and respected in the science fiction community, and he collaborated with Frederick Pohl and James Gunn. Frederick Pohl especially, he really enjoyed working with. Now, Pohl was somebody who had a lot of collaborators. He was uh, big in the, the science fiction community, and starting from the, I guess, the 40s, and well on at least into the 80s, and he actually gets quoted in that Partners of Wonder book that I referred to last time when we were talking about Leslie Stone. Right. And mm -hmm. it kind of makes Paul look like, I don't know, again, it, it, it might have just been the, the things that the writer of that book chose. But the quotes from Paul make him seem like maybe not the ideal science fiction critic. But he was a, certainly a great writer, and I appreciate a lot of his stuff. He's really funny, clever. I can't wait to get to some Frederick Paul stories. He's also kind of dark sometimes, and he actually has a story in the sequel anthology to The Dark Descent, which is cool. I like how they included a lot of science fiction horror stories from the kind of that period in those anthologies. Anyway, Williamson's supposed to have invented several words, and I, I don't know. I don't want to put too much stock in this because like, we just don't know for sure, but he's credited with the word terraforming used in his CT series of stories in the 40s, as well as the later psionics and he also had a book heavily concerned with mentioning the phrase genetic engineering in 1951 pretty early on before watson and crick's genome discovery and in the 50s he got involved with creating a comic strip series beyond mars for the new york daily news which ran alongside dick tracy until 1955 he finally earned a b.a and masters in english and started teaching high school at roswell new mexico military academy and this paid much better than writing science fiction, that's for sure. I would imagine. <laughs> he planned for a PhD. Late in life, he discovered an affinity for older classic literature. In a nice wraparound, Williamson's dissertation was called H.G. Wells, Critic of Progress. So that's just so fitting, considering how we started out with the new accelerator and yeah. where we are now. All this university work was done at the University of Colorado, and he ended up getting a teaching position at Eastern university back home in new mexico in 1964 and his learning wasn't done it's fascinating that he kept going with his education this long and sometimes even though and it seems like it started out wanting to improve his ability to write science fiction but then he got really really involved with it and he saw the new generation of the 1960s grow up and in a way was their peer even though he was heavily involved in teaching by now and he got very excited by Noam Chomsky and transformational grammar. And linguistics became a new fascination of his. And this branched out into computer science. There's something that he was saying around this time, which I think is pretty interesting. And it kind of shows how 
this guy, in a lot of ways, was our, our first author to have a sort of a modern understanding of science and physics the way we know it today. So he says, language and the mind will never be precisely what Chomsky tried to make them. The problem is a gap between the mind and reality. Besides, perhaps, astronomy, linguistics and meteorology are the sciences I've worked hardest to master. Studies of human behavior and air mass behavior. They're about as far apart as possible, yet oddly alike. Each constructs those essential mental models that sometimes allow understanding and prediction and control. But such models never equal nature. They have to be simple. Reality isn't. Always probing deeper, we find more and more complexity. Even in physics, searching for the simplest and most basic sort of matter, we find its molecules dissolving into atoms. Atoms no longer uncuttable come apart into electrons and protons and neutrons. These in turn split and split again until we reach the quark, which itself defies simplicity with such aspects as color and flavor and charm, all without apparent end. We have to seek simplicity, choosing patterns we can grasp. Models in abstract math or maps or art or everyday language. Good models enable us to cope, but they never fit any ultimate reality. Not entirely or exactly, because we must sacrifice detail to get some comprehensible simplicity. If our genes do in fact leave a gulf between reality and the ways we can know it, the far frontiers of every science may always be mysterious. So, guys, how do you think that's a contrast to the wonderful science fiction essay from back in 1928? <laughs> Yeah, no, it's really interesting how he evolves his personal philosophies. And yeah, yeah. I would like to read something from the end of his career to contrast it with this. Because, yeah. I mean, I think his last novel was published right around the time of his death. And I think some short uh, stuff was published. 2005, yeah. I think, yeah, there, I think there was still some short stuff that was published posthumously as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, he had different periods of being somewhat prolific. You know, he kind of slowed down a lot during certain decades like i don't think he wrote a lot in the 60s and he's kind of hard on actually a lot of his own work which i, I find kind of interesting mm. he's proud of some of it and he, he mentions the ones that he really appreciates it. yeah yeah i would definitely like to check out some of his later work as well i mean i, I have not read any of williamson's besides this story so i would like to look at more of his work no, I haven't yeah. either, but I think he has something like 50 full-length novels, plus yeah. who knows how much short pieces. There's certainly a lot there to choose from. I don't know yeah. exactly how many. It doesn't seem like he's like as prolific as some other guys in the field, but at the same time, he had a lot of other stuff going on as well. So <laughs> and it's kind of like, and he is known as a kind of a real master in his own way who just kept going. Never really stopped doing what he was doing. Because Eastern University is quite small, Williamson said he was given a lot of freedom to and trusted by his colleagues not to specialize. So this meant that he was teaching courses in quite a few different areas, and he taught everything from creative writing, technical writing, history of literary criticism, modern mystery fiction, and film studies. And relevant, Jack taught what's probably considered the second course in science fiction studies in a North American university from 1964 until his retirement in the late 70s. And he spent a lot of the 70s embroiled in academia and also traveling the world, which he wrote about a bit about in his autobiography. It's very, it's, it's, it's clear that these experiences meant a lot to him. It, it sounds, it sounds like they were a little bit like, see this, see that, like go all over the world and make sure you see the important things. But he also makes a note of a lot of the non like standard kind of touristy experiences that he had and what he thought about the different places that he visited. And he started to take umbrage at American exceptionalism and stuff like that and an assumed superior attitude, even though sometimes he comes across as a bit of an American patriot and some of what he thinks in his writing and stuff. So it's just kind of interesting. One of the things that he did actually pretty late in the game at, a, I think, 1980 was he edited Teaching Science Fiction and Education of Tomorrow, which contains articles by Le Guin, James Gunn, Isaac Asimov, and others, with a foreword by Carl Sagan. Now, I think it's time to finally get into our story. <laughs> that was a really long intro. Uh, I hope that you guys 
thought it was interesting and worth it. Yeah, yeah he's got an interesting career in life, for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very prolific and had a very eventful life, so it's interesting to go into that. <laughs> yeah. The story we're about to discuss, The Princess Base, is an early story, and he has something to say about it, which I will relate after we actually talk about the story. And He doesn't have that much to say about it. It's not, it's not one that he remembers that much. But I think it was a cool story to do because it's pretty early in his career. It's got lots of super science, which is kind of what Amazing is all about in a lot of ways at this time, especially. And it's an interesting example of somebody who is basically the guy that wrote that editorial. It has a lot of the things he's talking about. It has the clean golden cities and stuff like that. And it's got a space habitat which is apparently an early example of something like that. It's got a lot of stuff in it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's at its core, stuff, it is a pretty ridiculous romp, but the amount of like sci-fi tech it has is pretty impressive for the word count, I have to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of different concepts. Yeah. So I wouldn't call this... I mean, indeed, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call this high literature, but I yeah, as well as having so many firsts and everything. It's interesting that you can sort of see that this is written by a pretty young person and he doesn't have a lot of experience yet, but for the most part, it goes pretty smoothly, I thought. It doesn't go down hard. It's got some really funny elements to it and it's got a couple of flaws that I think are, are really sort of important to mention, if not damning, but that it's are kind of interesting in their own way. A part of the reason why I did this really long intro besides informing everyone and taking a long time with doing it, was basically that I really like this guy, but this story is, is ridiculous in some ways, and I'm definitely going to have some fun with it. So you guys can too. And yeah, uh, before we get started with the summary and stuff, what other thoughts did you guys have that you might want to talk about in a very general way before we kind of get into the nitty gritty of what Jack was doing in his really early days. I also, I, I would say that this is not one of my favorite stories that we read <laughs> for this month. But I feel like it's the same thing with this story that it is for something like Hansen and something like Irving, where you do have more of a, an appreciation for it when you realize that this is an early story from someone who would go on to be such a yeah. Someone who was so prolific. And yeah, you, you do see the, the elements from that letter in this story. And I still think that there's a real enthusiasm to it that makes me feel a little more lenient towards it than I would if it didn't have that same energy to it. Yeah, I think another good thing about it is it doesn't overstay its welcome. Like mm -hmm. if this was a 100,000 word novel, I would kind of get tired of it. But the fact yeah. that it's like, a fairly short work, like I, it's maybe a little longer than a short story, maybe like short novella territory. But a lot happens in this yeah. short yeah. story. Like it's it it, does. there's a lot happening. <laughs> yeah, but it goes by really, really quick. And <laughs> while it's silly and ridiculous in places, it's also like a lot of fun too. So I think that helps it out a lot. And the prose is clunky in places, but the amount of future speculation and devices he has, even if they're a little silly. It's just kind of fun to read because he is thinking a lot about like all this stuff and you can tell he really gets into geeking out about the science. Yeah. Yeah. And he really, he really does. And at this point he didn't really have that much of a scientific education. So, you know, he's just kind of doing a lot of speculating and I don't know it's, it's kind of cool. It's, it's not bad. I actually like this a lot more than out of the void. Oh, to yeah. me, this was much better than that. <laughs> Yeah, I do have to say, I think that Out of the Void, The Stone, was, was my least favorite, and I, I think that this one is an improvement on that, definitely. Yeah, yeah, I have to agree that Out of the Void was my least favorite, and this one is far better, even though this is not a literary masterpiece, and even though I liked most of the other stories this episode better than this, it just didn't drag like Out of the Void did, mm -hmm. and you know, you always kind of felt like it was going somewhere. And the yeah. plot is kind of, I, I wouldn't say formulaic, but it's kind of more typical of these kind of romances where all right, the good guys win in the end. And you can kind of see this arc of like a, the, a conflict brewing between the protagonist and the antagonist and all that. Mm -hmm. I like the way this one kind of threw a couple of deceptions at you, you know, like the way you thought it was 
like the princess base was a bad guy at first and you know he's not obviously mm-hmm. uh, there's some neat things about this there's a lot of real silliness which we'll we'll take great pleasure in getting into mm-hmm. but yeah i mean there were a few things that made this better than out of the void and i think even the funny things about it that were funny were funny in a way that i found more entertaining when a dick joke was the the best that I could get out of out of the void, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. But I think I'd like to get into talking about the story a little more, so we can stop being so general. red rocket flared from the fury. White lances of flame darted from the downturned vacuum tubes. As one, the nine ships lifted themselves from the level field. Deliberately, they upturned from horizontal to vertical positions. Upward they flashed through the air, slender white rays of light shooting back from the eight rear tubes of each. Bill, standing beneath the crystal dome, felt the turning of the ship. He felt the pressure of his feet against the floor, caused by acceleration. He sat down in a conveniently padded chair. He watched the earth become a great bowl, a sapphire sea on the one hand, green brown land and diminishing smokeless city on the other. He watched the hazy blue sky become deepest azure, then black a million still stars bursting out in pure colors of yellow and red and blue. He looked down again and saw the earth become convex, an enormous bright globe, mistily visible through haze or air and cloud. Swiftly the globe drew away, and a tiny ball of silver, half black, half rimmed with blinding flame, sharply marked with innumerable round craters swam into view beyond the misty edge of the globe. It was the moon. Beyond them flamed the sun, a ball of blinding light, winged with a crimson sheet of fire, hurling quivering lances of white heat through the vitrolite panels. Blinding it was to look upon, unless one wore heavily tinted goggles. Before them hung the abysmal blackness of space, with a canopy of cold, hard stars blazing as tiny, scintillant points of light at an infinite distance away. The galaxy was a road belt of silvery radiance about them, set with ten thousand many-colored jewels of fire. Somewhere in the vastness of that void, they saw the daring man, who left at society and called himself the Prince of Space. So this story is from the 1931 January issue, and it had the cobbler illustration. And he was paid $125 for this story. It was originally submitted to Astounding, like I said, and that was thought to be a somewhat better paying magazine. Here we go with the story. So Bill is a reporter living in 22nd century New York City, and he will guide us through this story, though it isn't his. And this is mostly taken from his diary. He was expecting to write a book on the subject of his adventures, but instead we get a story in Amazing Stories by Jack Williamson. Hmm. Well then, so the story is that of the Prince of Space. Everyone knows of the Prince of Space. He is a pirate, a hated figure when the solar-powered ships of the day are destroyed and cargo stolen. It's the prince who's blamed, and he's usually 
more than happy to take credit, leaving a calling card of sorts on the scene. The New York of the future is bustling, modern. Skyscrapers thrust their slender spires towards the clouds. The air is clean and unpolluted. Robots offer wares to passers-by. Helicopters whiz everywhere. Loudspeakers blare out news stories. The newspapers are printed on demand and issue forth from a machine, warm and slightly wet. We see a report this Bill himself takes pride in having written. Newly printed, the report describes an attacked passenger ship found drifting somewhere in Lunar Range, where 200 people were found dead and horribly mutilated. The prince doesn't normally kill his victims, let alone mutilate, just steals the precious metal, Vitalium. Well, that's gone in this case too, anyway. About a million eagles worth. And yes, the eagles is the currency they use in this future time. Still, this doesn't seem like the Prince of Space somehow. Nevertheless, the reward for the prince's capture or death is set by a bunch of independents, corporations and such, is 10 million eagles. Now, dominating the skyline at this time is a huge observatory tower. This was newly built by a professor who seems to have mysteriously come into possession of a vast amount of money, or perhaps a sponsor. And this is Professor Trainer, and we will be meeting him soon. He's had the wild audacity to build an observatory 12,000 feet into the sky, two and a half miles up into the New York skyline. It's the victory of science. No one knows much about what goes on in Trainer's tower. Important men seem to enter, as well as the professor and his daughter Paula. There's also a mysterious Mr. Kane, whom Bill, with all his contacts, can't seem to identify. And it's this mystery man that gets Bill, as he almost automatically gets off the moving walkway near the tower. And he offers him a look inside. And he says publicity for the tower's purpose is needed now. So they go up in the elevator. And at the top, in the observatory, Trainer sits alone, a kindly old bald fellow, working a huge telescope, and he says he wants to show him something on Mars and positions the apparatus, which has great powers of magnification. And the professor announces that a blue spot in the upper right quadrant is the death sentence of humanity. Bill, who can of course see all the, the presumably dry canals, is skeptical, but recalls past fiction like the War of the Worlds, and perhaps other stuff like Claire Winger Harris's The Fate of Posidonia, where the Martians want to steal water. But I don't know. Maybe that didn't last as long as H.G. Wells. Well, I mean, it's published recently within this time frame. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, nah, I just was being funny about it. It's just like that story was published there, too. And yeah, right. maybe people remember, hey, the Martians want to steal our water, right? Uh, <laughs> apparently, they, they, somebody thought an ark was real or something yeah, like that. Yeah, right. right. So you never know. Yeah, that was from one of Service's novels oh yes the second deluge right yeah he got republished by amazing a fair amount and i think edison's conquest of mars is another early parallel possible influence on this because there are some similarities between the two oh yeah we'll get to that yeah so the professor doesn't know their possible motive but he believes the martians have used captured technology from an expedition to mars lost over 25 years before to send craft to Earth. He can't say anything more. And Paula comes in, and she's described with some fascination as a remarkable person. And she says something about going to fight Martians before she's shushed. And she's definitely interested in the mysterious Mr. Kane, but he seems oblivious. And Kane is apparently in charge. And Bill's supposed to defer to him about when to publish and what to publish. So the next day, Bill is shocked to learn from the paper that Trainer's Tower was raided by the Prince of Space. A hole cut into the wall. Really high up. But anyway, I guess that happened. So, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the idea of picturing a two-mile-high building in New York City is pretty ridiculous. It's pretty ridiculous, and, and there's some weird there's weird stuff that happens here. I mean, you can yeah. tell that Williamson didn't really care about this kind of thing, but it was, like, a little too early on for him to... I guess I have knowledge about certain things, but I'm not saying that I'm necessarily smarter than he is. Like, it just comes from 
future stories and stuff like that where, where you kind of think about how some of this stuff would be done. Yeah, and there's like a lot of very convenient coincidences about oh, yeah. people meeting people here as well as mm-hmm. the fact that building a two mile high building and having nobody know what it's for, having it be some great mystery is just like very silly idea to begin with. So it seems like in this future, the private sector seems to have a lot of power. And I, it's not a theme that's overstated or even stated at all, really, but it just seems like not a lot is done in the behest of governments. It's all like private citizens and corporations and stuff. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Did you guys get that impression? There is quite a bit of talk of like corporations kind of having power. I mean, they're part of the people who do have this hit out on the Prince of Space, right. a lot of corporations. So, yeah. yeah, it does seem like there's this implicit idea there. We don't spend a lot of time on Earth and in New York. I mean, it's really mm-hmm. only kind of this beginning part. We spend a lot of the story elsewhere. Mm-hmm. My impression of how it was was kind of like this guy had all this money to do this and nobody could stop him, even though he's just some professor and everybody's like, well, that's kind of weird. Like, he just sort of had so much money that nobody really could do anything about it. <laughs> it's like, yeah, he's rich. Let's let him just build this huge structure here. Yeah. It's like right in the middle of the city, this gigantic. <laughs> <laughs> So, upon examination, it appears the 200 corpses on board the Helicon, which is the name of the passenger ship that was destroyed, were all drained of blood through ominous circular wounds. So, is the Prince of Space, in fact, some sort of alien vampire? Nine ships are to be sent after the Prince of Space. So now, a few days later, Bill is bound for space himself. A special correspondent to the New York Herald. He's to join a crew on a Moon Patrol sunship. These are big octagonal ships with plenty of positive ray tubes. Now, the positive ray is not the Care Bear's secret weapon, but instead it acts as both propellant and a destructive force. And these are huge vacuum tubes that fire protons, I think. And Bill boards the flagship, meeting the leader, a Captain Brand, a square-jawed, blue-eyed type, who knows from a previous mission, and the captain expresses uncertainty that the prince is actually responsible for all this, since the method seems so different, but shrugs it off, saying, We blow him to eternity on sight! And the small fleet tunes its motor ray generators and lifts off. And they don't really seem to know where to look, so they're just sort of flying around for days. But it's kind of a cool atmosphere. Like, it's very technical and kind of epic at the same time. There's a big sense of wonder and, like, the men on the ship are calling out all these figures and stuff like that. And it's, it's I don't know, it's cool. I liked it. It had a, a cool atmosphere. It reminded me of, like, first getting into sci-fi and being all like, wow, cool spaceships. It does feel very modern in that sense. Like, this, these parts, especially with, like, the spaceships flying around and yeah. these seek and destroy missions and we're going to get into like some space battles in a bit but mm-hmm. I don't know it just feels like a lot more contemporary in the sense of like modern science fiction than a lot of the other stuff that we've covered up to this point. Yeah, yeah I mean we kind of saw this in the Angel of the Revolution didn't we? In a sense but I, this, yeah. is, this just feels different. I mean it's different because it's in space but it, and it also feels like it's still part of that tradition kind of. Yeah. Especially the way he describes certain things happening, like them using a piece of rubber to, to stop a, a decompression hole in the ship, like when they're in, even when they're in space, right? Yeah. You know, it's just it's funny, kind of, but it's cool. And the crazy thing is, this it wasn't that long after Age of the Revolution, really. It's 40, well, okay, 40 years or so, I guess, but still. Then they spot a small, round blue ship about 15,000 miles distant. The prince at last, Bran says, but is it though? Bill thinks it looks like the thing he saw when they were looking at Mars. So the captain attempts to hail her with the heliograph. It's kind of interesting to me that there's no mention of radio anywhere in this story. Did you notice that? I didn't mark that down. I mean, he does use the vacuum tubes, which were a very essential radio component at the time yeah but they're used for like he, something he else. knew about radio i mean yeah. he built the crystal set and everything the radio right. is not mentioned once in this story they're all communicating by like flashing semaphore codes yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's so weird yeah because i mean we're definitely beyond the wireless telegraphy point of radio where like now radio is being like commercially broadcasted so i mean 
people's conception of radio in 1931 is more or less the same as it is now. Yeah, and maybe, I don't know, maybe you thought it wouldn't work in space or in yeah, a thin atmosphere. I don't, I don't really know. Like, they're using it on Mars, too. Like, they don't have radio. It's so interesting. It's so different than... It reminds me of something, and I can't remember what it is. These, like... I can't remember if it was a story that we ran through the podcast. It's like, it, it, I have a picture in my head of two guys walking on an alien planet and they can't talk to each other and they're wearing helmets and they're like, like nowadays we would just be like, oh yeah, they have a suit radio. Right. But apparently it's not always assumed that radio waves will operate in either in space or in like a thin atmosphere environment like Mars even. It's just interesting the way they decided to do it. Because radio was a technology that certainly existed, so you didn't use it. I don't know. It, it, maybe it's weird that that stood out to me right away. Like, hey, there's no radio. <laughs> yeah, I guess maybe he just assumed that communications technology would evolve in a way that would be unrecognizable, just the way that two-mile-high buildings in New York would be unrecognizable <laughs> or uh, some of yeah. the other stuff that comes in later. Yeah. Newspapers are still around, though. Right. Yeah. Well, we still use those for sure. <laughs> They do have loudspeakers blurring out the news, though, just like on Fortune from the Sky. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And, and there's like these like ticker machines, too, which just give printouts of stuff. Yeah. I like that. I like yeah. the on-demand printout machine. Yeah. So that was cool. <laughs> so, yeah, they're, they're trying to use the semaphore, but nothing. So the ships exchange fire, and the Martians have some kind of atomic bomb, which they start chucking at the humans. And this is kind of what happens throughout the story. I almost... It almost has a video game-like regularity to it, like whenever they meet, it's always, fire the positive rays, they're shooting atomic bombs at us. That's like, I don't know, I just, like, I picture it in this, like, Atari graphics kind of way, I guess. <laughs> There's little lines, and I don't know, it's just kind of cool, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I love how nonchalantly sometimes the atomic bombs are used, like atomic power. There's one part when it's, like, only a few people that are hit by one and it's, it's almost like only only like two of them die but the others still manage to survive it a very controlled atomic blast <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah the positive rain fire doesn't do any good and they have some kind of force field or as they say a vibratory screen and brad decides it's up to their ship to ram the enemy and bill's oddly okay with this even though he didn't sign up for suicide <laughs> So there's a crash and everything goes dark and Captain and Bill lie in their freezing tomb and then some suited figures cut a hole in the wall and drag them out. And Bill awakes in a nice warm bed and Bran is there too and they are being attended to by those who serve the Prince of Space. And they are on his personal ship, the Red Rover, bound for his base. They are prisoners... But not to worry, the prince is magnanimous, and he's saved their lives. He's not the real enemy, anyway. The city of space is a giant cylinder made of meteoric iron. And Captain Smith makes a point of pointing out that they've made the spaceways safer for navigation, and not just taken material that they need to use. Saving the spaceways, that's the prince of space. The city is protected by the cylinder, which spins to provide artificial gravity. And the city itself is very charming and domestic. It looks like a nice neighborhood that you'd want to be in. Apparently 5,000 people live in the city, and it's full of greenery. And some have been captured by the prince, and some recruited by other means. And the captain and Bill are taken by helicopter to a building where they meet the mysterious Mr. Kane! And this is what... Bill exclaims upon seeing him. <laughs> he is, in fact, the Prince of Space. There was no kidnapping, and Paula and the Professor are his friends, and just he just orchestrated the whole thing to get them out of sight for a while. And besides, the Professor's expertise needed up here right now, but Paula doesn't want to let the Prince out of her sight, and there's some anguish about it. And here, Captain Smith makes some comments about the prince being a confirmed misogynist and blames some past crappy love affair. Yeah, it's a really weird phrasing he has here for this. Yeah. Like, it, it kinda... yeah. 
Yeah, it's yeah. a weird thing in general. It's, it's pretty hilarious and not that great, but we'll get to it. There's more coming. <laughs> oh, yes, there's more coming. It, this also reminds me of the stone where it's like someone is so nonchalantly brought up to be like a misogynist. Yeah. The, the specific term where it's well, almost yeah. like you can just proudly proclaim yourself as a misogynist. Well, I think now, like back in 1929, it was kind of like, oh, you're just a misogynist. That's not so bad. We'll cure you. I don't know. The prince is oblivious to Paula's obviously intense feelings, and that's all we need to know for now, I guess. But the spacemen are aware that the Martians have landed a force in Mexico, and that's their first point of attack. So there is a new weapon, a sort of rocket launcher. They call it a torpedo, and that's something that Trainor invented, which they're going to test. So the prince, Smith, Brad and Bill and some other guy are ready to go deal with this. And if they're not back by the next night, assume they've been killed. Paul is very unhappy about this. And there's some description of the arid landscape where they've ended up. And yeah, I think Williamson might know what he's talking about here. Yeah. There's actually some pretty good descriptive writing in this story, I think. I think this is a cut above some of the other stuff that we've seen in terms of like just actually getting the atmosphere right. The way he talks about the landscapes and stuff like that, and the way he talks about, like, yeah, what it's like in space, even if some of the elements of the super science are silly. Yeah, and I mean, again, mm -hmm. it does feel quite modern and different from Angel of the Revolution or the Edison Odds, where you could definitely see there is a clear lineage between the two, but the way yeah. he handles the subject matter, I don't know, it just feels like... It could be made into a movie today without a lot of changes to it. Yeah, actually, I have an idea for the ideal form of The Prince of Space. Nate, you know what it is, but Gretchen, I don't know if you saw my comment. No, I don't. The Prince of Space should be a musical. <laughs> I mean it. <laughs> That's what it needs to be. It should be a musical. It should be an over-the-top musical with like big songs and everything like that. It should be a literal space opera. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, have you guys have you guys heard of Jeff Wayne's War of the Worlds? No. No. It's an actual musical version of the War of the Worlds and it's like basically <laughs> prog disco, I guess. Huh. Like it's it's late seventies prog rock kind of. It's got a lot of cool guest stars like Justin Haywood from the Moody Blues and Phil Wynant from Thin Lizzy and Richard Burton reads excerpts from the H. G. Wells novel. It's pretty epic. Yeah, certainly when we cover oh. that novel we'll have to get into some of the weird adaptations <laughs> yeah yeah so i kind of picture this like that and it's like so they find the martian dumb and they fire their torpedoes at it and also destroy their ship and they go to see what damage they've done and come face to face with a martian he's a plant with a lot of tentacles and three purple eyes on stalks that have suckers on the ends he's also on the cover isn't he i believe so it's. yeah <laughs> yes Yes, it's the Martian having a nice meal, I think you said? I got it up. It's the Martian attacking one of the, the other creatures that are on Mars. Ah, the primates. Okay. Yes, right. Yeah. And yeah, the primate has a very, <laughs> again, <laughs> ugly expression on his face. Um, <laughs> Damn it. And you can see one of the blue globes in the background. Yeah, right. Oh. It is very literally like a globe, like a yes. metal sphere wow. type thing. <laughs> yeah, very spider-like creature. It's 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 a cool creature, but again, his figure drawing and like facial expressions are are just like I don't know, really off-putting and a yeah. kind kind of like I don't know. I, I don't even know how to describe it. It's just childish. <laughs> well, maybe yeah. I, I guess that could be one way to describe it. Yeah, um, I don't know. It's just it, it's kind of I don't know. I can't see them, so I'm just kind of like yeah. No, it's just kind of like <laughs> ugly and in like offsetting way, like uh, yeah. like whole uncanny valley type thing where it's just yeah. like I don't know. It kind of unsettling in a way. Yeah, I also expected the Martians. I I think I pictured them as having many more tentacles than that. Yeah, yeah. It's not a mass of tentacles. It's very. It's just sort of like there's uh, there's a, a number of them. Coming from, like, the central body of the creature. But I just expected, like, it just to be all tentacle, I guess. Yeah, he's got maybe a dozen or so. Um, probably he he could he could have up to, like, a hundred or so for it to be a mass, you know? Yeah, the way Wild Jack describes him, he certainly seems pretty tentacle-y. Yeah. yeah. But he also seems very plant-like, more than spider-like. Like, I don't know, he just he, he uses a lot of plant words to describe him, probably just to make him seem weird, right? 
Yeah, so, I, I like weird plants just... and stories. I mean, it's a yeah. it's a yeah. cool monster. Like it reminds me of the crinoid from Doctor Who, right? Or mm-hmm. the cactus thing from Queen or Mouse. Yeah, there's so many examples. The Day of the Triffids. Mm-hmm. Oh, what was another good plant monster? Some of the evil trees and stories, like yeah, Algernon Blackwood's The Willows, or early on in uh, Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. Evil trees are awesome. Jack Vance has an evil tree story. Clark Ashton Smith has a few of them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the Martian uses an atomic bomb on them, which seems like overkill. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but these atomic bombs are like both small and precise and really powerful, I guess. They like they have different magnitudes of them. Yeah. Know, it's not really, maybe it's they're not just really good at but... channeling energy in the far future where it could control an atomic explosion. Yeah, yeah, because it de- definitely doesn't seem like there's another mushroom cloud coming out of New Mexico <laughs> in this part. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but Smith and the one officer guy are dead, but the rest are all manacled on the ground, waiting to be food for the Martian vampire. And since it's last word for those guys, and they're getting to that, like, they're going to die, so it's time to talk, and it's have time, time to have an epic emotional moment. And Bill tells the prince what he knows that he's been missing. The love of Paula. And the prince goes, I don't believe in love. It's never worth the pain that you feel. Well, once it was, see, someone took advantage of him. And now he wants nothing to do with it. Apparently, this woman is the source of most of his bad reputation. Now, he's known about the Martians and suspected their plans for a really long time, and at first he was thinking he'd just let the human race get snuffed. And he expresses some nihilism here, and the prince is moody and hateful in his last moments. And they all share a final cigarette. Now, after hours, the creature moves in for the kill, and it almost kills the prince, but then who should show up but Paula, blasting away, directly disobeying orders. And good thing she did. So, Paula, right? I guess this is good a time to talk about Paula as any. She's a real, like, huh. She's a problem (laughs) problem character in this whole story. And and it doesn't, like, it's funny because, like, I think, I can't remember who pointed this out. I think it was David Hartwell who edited the anthology where I found this, which is the Space Opera Renaissance anthology. Mm. That Paula is an attempt of a young man in the 1920s basically in the 1920s, to write a strong woman. But it's really a failure on, like, mm-hmm. every level. And she's really melodramatic yeah. and, like, irritating. Yeah. yeah. Like, you get glimpses of her, like, where she can be really cool. Like, I thought it was cool that she showed up and was able to deal with the Martian. Yeah, and she's doing all the sciencey stuff, which is cool. Yeah, it's still, like, it's all in the service of the prince. And, it, you right. know, it just it, that just looms over her character to the point where it just kind of taints her. Even when she does things where, like, on their own, if this were divorced from him, it would have been kind of neat to see. Yeah, and we haven't really encountered a lot of women characters that take up, like, a substantial portion of the plot. To this point, like, there have been a couple, but I think this is the first one we've covered on the podcast where it does follow the really annoying and bad trope of women as a trophy uh, you know, mm, to be yeah. won by the main character at the end. And that kind of is what happens here. And it's kind of like what her, like, I don't know, ultimate role in the story is. And it's just, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know. I, I <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, it, it's not my favorite. That's for No, sure. it's not good. But, I mean, you know, like, here's the thing. I don't know. I, I mean, I. this is a, not only is it an old story, but it's by a, a person who, I guess, lived a certain way. And he admitted himself that he didn't really have a lot of experience with women. And he married, I don't know if she was exactly his high school sweetheart, but it really doesn't seem like from his reading his autobiography, he's certainly not one who talked about having a lot of other experiences. Like he talked about visiting a prostitute and it not really working out very well. So I don't know. Like he was pretty candid about it. I mean, he's not like candid in the sense that he gives a lot of detail, but he's candid in the sense that, yeah, like, yeah, I wasn't, I didn't know what I was talking about. I still might not know what I'm talking about because I married, you know, like, I don't know. I just, it's, he, he kind of, he's pretty disarming about it. Like it's just, he, he tries to do his best, but he just doesn't have any experience with women at, at all. 
and he knows that it's something that's could be considered a fault, I guess, but I don't know. It's just, just pretty early on. He's really sort of groping his way through emotions, I think. He always talks in his autobiography about trying to get the emotions right in his writing and structure versus feeling, and it seems like this was like a really big deal to him. And he's like, first I had to, you know, I struggled for like decades to try to get structure right, and then I was trying to get feeling, and sometimes I would just have the structure and no feeling, and then and sometimes I would be like, you know, and he's trying to, I don't know, it's interesting seeing a, a writer grasp at the process and try to get it you know try to get it right so and he was fairly young when he wrote this i mean he was like what 21 yeah. 22 or something like that yeah by his account he lived a pretty rough life he just stayed away from women so i mean i'll i'll relate something that he said in his autobiography and he's like talking about his meager religious education despite his father and his upbringing and like it was kind of very perfunctory when he was young and then he talks about his sexual education and his sexual education was basically him going to see with his father a bull and a heifer mating. And he was apparently so horrified by the way this looked that he turned to his dad and he said, Don't tell me that people are made that way. And his dad was like, Yup. And in his autobiography, he's like, and That was my sex education. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's I mean, pretty funny. Kind of almost like funny a story, kind of yeah. thing of you know, <laughs> weird revulsion. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Not much to say to that, I guess. But Paul and Bill look after the prince by while Bran goes to bring the ship back, and Paul is more attentive to the prince than ever. And the prince gruffly just says she's done a great thing for the world. It wasn't for the world; it was for you. She says weepily. And well, yeah, that's sad. But they have much work ahead of them. And the prince makes Bran captain of the fleet. And now the prince needs two tons of Italian. And he needs it in 24 hours. And it's Bill's job to convince the world about the menace from Mars. But he can't bring the prince into the story at all. So now they drop him on the top of Trainer's Tower. Which seems a real disservice to me. They're up on top there. But luckily the trap door is conveniently unlocked. And hopefully it's not too windy up there. I don't know. They they, they must be getting what, two miles up. That's uh, yeah. yeah uh, <laughs> it's impractical for a they lot just of drop in there. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, but anyway, he does his best to spread his story, but it's not generally believed. And even though there's physical evidence, for one thing, it's clear that Bill is making up a lot of bullshit, which he is, since he can't talk about the prince. And there's an unprecedented court injunction to prevent the Herald Sun from collecting money from new subscriptions, which they were going to use to actually finance the Vitalium. And Bill is nearly arrested. I did want to say also, I think it's funny yeah. at this point, when he's telling his story that is a lie, he's like, oh, I've thought this all through. I've had all this time to think about it. And he's like, this has to sound believable, or at least as believable as what happened with the prince. And it's so funny to yeah. see everyone immediately say, no, that, that's a lie. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> and no one believes him. This part was really funny to me. And this was like kind of, I like this was almost intentionally funny, but it was kind of like, you know, it's, it's just really amusing because there's a way out of this situation that I think somebody supposedly clever like the prince should have seen. But no. <laughs> Bill reports his failure to the prince, who makes a fatalistic comment about letting the Martians have Earth because people are idiots. And here's the best part. He has a perfectly good scapegoat in Professor Trainer, who has this gigantic 12,000 foot tower pointing up to the sky. Like, hey, by the way, I looked in my telescope and I saw the Martians were going to invade us. This is really serious business, guys. But no, Bill's like, some weird scientist guy kidnapped me? I don't know who he was. <laughs> and he said something about Martians. And it's really serious, guys. I saw one. And so, who's, what are we going to believe here, guys? Honestly, <laughs> it's so weird. Like, he could have just been like, Hey, I've got this professor trainer, but I don't know. I guess the professor is just too much of a hermit. He doesn't want to. He doesn't want to be known either. So, the mysterious Mister Kane, the Prince of Space, is more than willing to go along with it. So it's time for some piracy! Yay! 
Am I not the Prince of Space? He says. And here talks about the good of the many being greater than the good of the few. So he uses that to justify stealing from some corporations. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, and I think here is what I was also thinking about when you brought up that how corporations seem to control everything. I mean, that's like the first time they they even bring up like, yeah, we're going to steal from these corporations that are, yeah. you know, the most powerful entities around here. Don't forget the hero of this story is this like Nemo space pirate. Yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> and this is why this needs to be a musical, you know, he needs to he needs to like. <laughs> Be like the Phantom of the Opera in Andrew yeah. Lloyd Webber, you know, it's like this, <laughs> this sort of silly, romantic, not quite hero, you know. He could be a good rock opera hero. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So apparently Captain Brand always dreamed of being a pirate, too. And the ambush the Triton, which is a cargo ship, and its supply of Vitalium on the moon. So that was a pretty cool sequence as well. And they're pursued by the Moon Patrol, but somehow they manage to not lead them to the city of space. Next stop, Mars. And this chapter is called The Red Star of War. And that was pretty cool. But how the hell are they going to best the whole planet Mars? Well, the Prince and Trainer are working on an ultimate weapon. As yet, we don't really know any details about this, but there are experiments going on in a laboratory deep in the ship. Something about finding the essential force of life. Something linked with Vitalium, and destroying it, I suppose. So the journey passes almost without incident. They get hit by meteors, and the air almost gets sucked out of the bridge. Luckily, Bran is able to save them by closing a bulkhead and activating an air pressure valve. And they have a lucky encounter with a Martian ship very close to the planet. And they speculate about maybe it was headed for Earth. But they destroy it with a torpedo and even knock out an atomic bomb that was headed their way. So they're really lucky. And meanwhile, Trainer and the Prince have unlocked the secret of life. And now they need another precious metal, cerium. Well, they only need a little bit of this stuff. But where are they going to get it? They don't have any in their supplies. Oh no, well, they'll have to martyr from Mars, of course. And they have to find a remote location on the planet. So they leave the populated looking areas where the canals are which they see are actually irrigation ditches and they head for a barren area which they land in under cover of night and they discover here mars has a primate species that's similar to mankind in appearance and seems to exhibit signs of intelligence and complex emotion the martian plant monsters live in domes to protect themselves from the frequent and violent dust storms. And they also keep those man-like things as cattle and hunt them in the more remote areas sometimes. There's a couple of whole stories here that haven't been told, but the air is thin and breathable and the gravity is nice and fun. So we got our essential scene from every old science fiction story where somebody jumps in low gravity and sort of <laughs> flies around for a bit. And gets to exert themselves. But here the atmosphere is very thin, so it's actually kind of tiring to do that. Paula insists on going out too, and even though the prince has been trying to be indifferent to her, he makes excuses that sound perfectly reasonable if you're a chauvinist. And she gets her way, and Belle thinks he sees something awful in her eyes. Is Paula going to kill herself? Wow. Now, they see just how horrible the Martians are as they hunt and kill a family of three primates. And the family obviously cares for one another, and the Martians are just cruel as hell and playing with them. So, obviously they deserve to die. Happily, they seem to spot the Red Rover, and Bill opens fire and blows up the Martian globe. And on his way back from examining the remains, he very coincidentally comes across the remnants of the old Anvers Martian Expedition, specifically Anvers himself, which is a really graphically described desiccated corpse, which was kind of cool. Yeah. And yeah, they say that there's still remnants of human skin and hair and pieces of clothing yeah. in his, with his bones. Yeah, it's pretty graphic, I thought. Pretty gross. And this was kind of a, an interesting part because like here again, we got kind of a glimpse of the story that we didn't get told yeah and he like presents his information as you would be familiar with it and i was like wait did i miss something earlier in the story and i had to like search the name but no this is like oh the yeah, yeah. It appears. 
You know, it's mentioned earlier when Trainer talks about thinking that the Martians have captured the details of the ship that Edwards used. Yeah, it's like a very brief, like yeah. very passing reference. And yeah, it happens yeah. only like a page before it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he left a diary, too, which is not part of this book, but you can buy it from all robotic printing press mechanisms for 10 cents. <laughs> it sounds like it was a real adventure. I would and, imagine so, yeah. Yeah. So then it really does confirm that the Martians will probably keep some humanity around as cattle, as they were raising the remains of the expedition as some kind of breeding stock, which I guess suggests there were women on the ship, which is kind of interesting, I guess. Or though maybe they were trying to breed them with the Martian primates. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. It's not it's not very specific about that, but it's just interesting. A whole new, a whole other kind of thing that happened behind here. We don't get into the diary entries like Stone would have done. So yeah, he skips right to the end. <laughs> yeah, I mean this story could have been longer, but I don't know. You see, there's there's so much in this, and it's kind of cool how much he pack, packs in here. And he doesn't describe it that badly, but he, and he just kind of. I inserted the thing about the being able to buy the diary as it's sort of sarcastic, but he did actually suggest that you could. The diary has been published elsewhere or something like that. It was like a very simple comment. And I was just like, oh, really? That's cool. <laughs> send so. Hugo Gerns back $2 and he'll send you the diary in a month and a half. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, there's a dust storm coming up and it's a, it's a harrowing moment. As Bill lies flat, trying to shield himself as it rages around him. But when everything's still, the rover is still there and all right. So they have to leave soon, and there are some Martian globe ships rapidly approaching. They're getting all this machinery on the ship, and it's frantic. And then they notice Paula's not there. She hasn't responded to the signal. And one of the new machines hanging out near the ship is this weird thing with prisms and lenses and condensers and mirrors. And I quoted that because that's exactly what he said. So all, all these different things, really cool, kind of bulky looking, weird machine with a vacuum tube core. Left his vacuum tubes, even though there's no radio. But yeah, I mean, they have many uses. It is neat. So could that be the Vitomaton? What's the Vitomaton? <laughs> okay, well, give us a moment. Now, Bill's worried about Paula, don't forget. And the prince notices that she's gone. And Bill's all snide about it. Thought you didn't care, he said. Well, he does, actually. And here's where they find a really dramatic suicide note tied to a boulder. And with apologies to everyone, I'm going to read this horrible suicide note, which is like the worst thing ever. <laughs> I actually clip this same quote. Oh, you want to read it? You read the suicide note. <laughs> Uh, okay. <laughs> Fine. You were in. You go ahead. Read the suit. It's horrible. <laughs> All right. <laughs> to the Prince of Space, it ran. I can't go on. You must know that I love you. Desperately. It was maddening to be with you. To know that you don't care. I know the story of your life. I know that you can never care for me. The red dust is blowing now, and I'm going down in the desert to die. Please don't look for me. It will do no good. Pardon me for writing this, but I wanted you to know why I am going. Because I love you. Paula. Her timing is horrible! <laughs> <laughs> but the prince, you see, he looks at this and he stares at it for a long time and then he throws his head back and he goes, I love her! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> space opera. Yeah. <laughs> he says, it's been love all along and I've been stupid. And the prince announces, now that he has to find her at all costs, so luckily, there are tracks. And meanwhile, the globes are getting closer. And Bill certainly doesn't have to come, but I guess he wants to keep an eye on the prince. So now the prince doesn't care about the mission. It's just Paula. But he's kind of glad of Bill's presence anyway. And the ship and the Martian flyers get into a firefight. And they think the ship has been destroyed because there's been all these atomic bomb things going off. But the Vitomaton is their only hope. And they actually do see some weird colored lights in the sky. And the prince thinks that's the automaton in action. And I think he just starts to describe it at this point. He does a little bit later, but it's it's kind of like the force in Star Wars or something. It's like this beam of concentrated energy or something like that. That's 
I don't know. He has a, he has this weird way of describing it. It's like alive, and it's generated by the metallium generators, and it's fired from the ship, and it can consume anything. But as soon as they turn it off, it's gone. So it's kind of safe, I guess, relatively. But anyway, it's approaching night, and it gets very cold. So Jack does a really good job of describing hypothermia and how that might feel like. And again, you get some pretty cool descriptive writing. And they keep going, but it's quite a struggle. And the prince does find Paula somehow. Again, you know, there's a lot of coincidences, like people just stumbling across things. And that's kind of the essence of some of these kind of stories, right? It's just like, you happen to be in the right place at the right time. They happen to find Paula, who also, even though she was lying in the sand, in the cold, for presumably quite a long time, she's still awake and she forgives him, the prince. And now he's happy. And they struggle back to the ship, the prince gasping out words explaining the vitamaton and how it works. And they see the ship start to leave. Without them, up into space! <sighs> Gotta fire a torpedo, but it's too cold and they can't shift the lever. And the prince uses his chin and the ship comes back for them when they see the giant flare. And it seems the Martians were just trying to scare them with their purple atomic bombs. Take them alive for their science, as they say. And as they fly out, they see the huge machine, the blue spot seen earlier, has left the planet. And it's a gigantic warship, and it's heading for Earth. There's the infernal thing, carrying its cargo of horror to our Earth. It's certainly some very weird, stiff dialogue, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I can kind of picture it. It, it sounds like one of those, like, translated Italian space opera yeah. movies from the 60s or something. <laughs> and some of those are pretty fun, so... The Vitomaton makes short work of that thing, though. And it's the ultimate super weapon. And there's some fiddling around with a calculating machine and lots of figures on dials and math being done. And the thing comes into existence right there on the bridge and shoots through the crystal dome of the ship and creates this hole, which they have to seal with a piece of rubber. <laughs> Don't have any... Uh, I guess they can't fire this from the positive ray tubes. That may be... Next time, they'll configure that a little better. But the ship is destroyed, and now they have to see what the Martians will do. So they end up covering the whole planet in a force field, just like they do in Edison's Conquest of Mars, actually. And they launch this extra powerful atomic bomb, and the professor says, what if these would push the Earth out of the orbit? And so they target Mars, and, well... There's no other way to say it, guys, but the Vitomaton blows up Mars. So, yeah. goodbye, Martian vampire plants. We now have two asteroid belts. Yeah, goodbye, <laughs> Martian primates. It was nice knowing you. Too bad we couldn't save you. A total genocide. Yeah. yeah. This part is so bizarre, because it's also, like, they Death Star a planet. Yeah. And then, like, the prince has, like, this moment where he's very, like, you know, oh, it's so horrible to destroy this planet. And then moves immediately into, but I've got a girl now. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I've got a princess yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah, it's so weird. I'm going to read the, this part of this last part. Where Mars had been was nothing. The stars shone through, hot and clear. A machine no larger than a camera had destroyed a world. Bill was dazed, staggered. Solemnly, almost sadly, the prince moved a slender tan hand across his brow. A terrible thing, he said slowly. It is a terrible thing to destroy a world. A world that had been eons in the making and that might have changed the history of the cosmos. But they voted for war. We had no choice. Well, did they? <laughs> I mean, somebody did. <laughs> oh, it's it's really weird extreme solution. <laughs> so the prince tells trainer, I guess, to lock up the Vitomaton somewhere safe, where it'll hopefully be forgotten. And then he kisses Paula and announces that she is the princess of space. And nobody on Earth knows what's happened to Mars, and they're still out there searching for the prince. The reward is now twenty five million eagles and so ends 
the epic tale of the Prince of Space. Kind of surprising that blowing up an entire planet didn't make the reward go up more than like, you know, 150% or so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it was his only choice. So I guess as, since it was the last option, they're, they're going to be lenient on him. Yeah. You guys want to know what Jack himself said about this story many years later? Yeah, let's hear it. Yeah. I guess I'm going to tell you anyway, even if you say no. But <laughs> he said about this story, There's perhaps too much super science and melodramatic action leading up to the invention of an ultimate weapon with which the prince dissolves the hostile Martians and their whole planet into cosmic nothingness. This absolute weapon was tossed almost casually into the action among such other future wonders as Traynor's Tower, and the city of space. I'd forgotten it until I reread the story, but I recall now that I made much better use of such a weapon a few years later, renamed Akka, and treated with a fitting awe. It became the central premise of my series of novels about the Legion of Space. So I haven't read the Legion of Space, but I guess basically saying that it's kind of a, a testing ground, which I think a lot of these kind of short stories are a little bit for these early authors especially there's a lot of cases in amazing where the authors don't continue they don't even survive into the golden age like we don't get really 10 years of these some of these guys but obviously somebody like williamson is a huge exception interesting that he didn't remember it until rereading it <laughs> yeah so that quotes from the early williamson which is a compilation of some of his really early stories that story the Metal Man, which was his first published story and Amazing, is there. But The Prince of Space is actually not there. And I think it's interesting that David Hartwell chose to include this in the Space Opera Renaissance book, which is a really neat anthology, actually. And it does actually have a lot of extra material where the concept of what became Space Opera is pointed out and talked about and sort of debated as to whether it's a pejorative or not. And what we think of it now as opposed to what we might have thought of it say in the 1960s or 50s where it was kind of first coined kind of linked sarcastically with horse opera which is like a not that nice term for a western basically i like that term yeah. i think we should bring back horse opera <laughs> yeah <laughs> bring back horse opera i agree <laughs> <laughs> well, they brought back space opera. Why not? I think the only yeah. thing holding back the horse opera is that the westerns are just not that popular right now. No, it's kind of interesting because I mean they were really like at the forefront of genre writing being a thing. Like it started with mm -hmm. westerns, but mm -hmm. it's been on the pretty—I wouldn't even say steady decline, but it's almost been non-existent. I mean, you kind of have a couple entries every couple years or so, mm -hmm. but even yeah. that, it's kind of sparse compared to the stuff that they were churning out all the time and oh. you know, as, as late yeah. as the 60s. Yeah. Um, but I don't know, with, with this one, like it definitely feels very early for the space opera tropes where there are a lot of them here. And again, it's interesting to see just like how modern this feels, even though there is a very clear connection with earlier stuff like the Edison odds, like mm. Edison's Conquest of Mars and like Angel of the Revolution. But and its tone and the way it unfolds and just like the world that it lives in, it feels so much different than those works, even though you could clearly feel the influence pretty much throughout the entire story of how the 
pulp adventure unfolds, the kind of exaggerated caricature types, it's kind of interesting just to note how far he progresses the basic formula in that short amount of time. Yeah, I agree. And it felt new. And it also felt like I enjoyed kind of seeing those parallels to stuff written in the 1890s, like Angel and Edison. Right. Right. Gretchen, you weren't a part of the podcast when we did those, but uh, yes. I think you've heard us talk about them enough times, right? Yes. I mean, I definitely remember when you were both reading Edison's Conquest of Mars. So yeah, I, I'm familiar. Yeah. I, even though I haven't read them myself, I am familiar with them. I would say this one is better than both. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's kind of like one of those weird things where I didn't think The Angel of the Revolution was a incredibly well-written book, but it seems like it keeps coming up. Like, I keep thinking of it as we go on, you know, and it's like, not to say that it was necessarily singly the most influential thing, but maybe in a sense, yeah, it was. Like, it's kind of like the quintessential weird air pulp novel, right? And it's it's got a lot of that operatic over-the-topness to it, too. Mm-hmm. So it's just really interesting because it's not a book I really knew anything about until, like, a couple of years ago. Yeah, I mean, for a brief period of time, he was, like, the most popular scientific romance guy. Yeah, yeah. Does anybody think that Williamson kind of missed a trick here in doing this story? And I kind of wonder if he was sort of, I mean, he was also an inexperienced writer. And I don't know, you know, maybe decades from then he would have written this differently. But it occurred to me that, so we have a bit of a weird narrative problem here in that this is supposed to be a story which has a reporter protagonist, but the story itself is paraphrased by someone else who's analyzing the diary of the reporter. So why have a reporter there in the first place? It could have been anybody. And actually, that made me think this story could have been a lot more fun, actually, if it had been told in the first person from the point of view of this grizzled New York reporter kind of guy. And well, why didn't we just get to see his diary instead, right? Like, he didn't talk about himself in the third person, right? (laughs) <laughs> so it's just kind of a weird device that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and it's also a missed opportunity. But also, I don't know if he could have realistically written about all the super science stuff the way he did if he had done it that way. I mean, I guess being a reporter, maybe. I mean, somebody like Jack Williamson himself seemed to take the trouble to find out about this kind of stuff. Like he talks about being on ships and like hanging out with the crew and finding out how they did stuff and how their stuff works and stuff like that. And so he would have been interested to know. So it's not inconceivable to think of a reporter who would have been like, so yeah, guys, here's how the city of space works. And it's it's a really swell novel concept. Listen up. And like, it's just, but I guess, I don't know. I guess that would have taken up a lot. And like, it probably would have taken up more space, I guess, if he'd written it like that with more like, yeah, here's this like chatty reporter personality and talking about this and that. And like, I don't know. I just, I just kind of like, picture somebody who was writing at the time like Dashiell Hammett and his like detective stories and, and that kind of style and how that could have been for this story. <laughs> it's it's something that I do sometimes when I read a story and I think about uh, what would this story be like if it were written in a different style and I'm thinking of this one and I'm like make it the reporter's diary that makes total sense and the funny thing is there's this conceit of having him there in the first place but he doesn't use it. <laughs> <laughs> I think, again, it's sort of a mark of his inexperience, maybe, as a writer. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of awkward stuff with the construction here. Yeah, like, I had forgotten that it was supposed to be written about the diary. (laughs) Like, it's just such a, it's a strange thing to bring up if you're not actually going to use that as as a point. Yeah, I mean, the whole thing is kind of ridiculous from the get-go, so you kind of just, yeah. like, immediately go with it. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. I love that it's, like, the second paragraph where he's like, this is not this man's story. <laughs> yeah. You're going to be hearing about this other guy who's a lot cooler. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In the individual elements and the paragraphs and, like, the sentences and everything, like, everything flows pretty well, and you go with it as you're going with it. And I think, like, only later do you kind of you kind of think, ah, you know, he didn't really take advantage of that. Like, I kind of picture the beginning, like, it's kind of intriguing, where it's like, this is a story about the prince's space. It's going to be told about this Bill person, but he's not really that important. And And the way that's done is kind of cool, but I kind of feel it should be more like, I'm Bill. I'm a reporter on the New York Herald. This isn't my story, but I was a part of it. 
and I got to shoot off a few missiles. Yeah, right. <laughs> so let me tell you how it went. And I just kind of think, man, why didn't he do it like that? Like, that would have been so cool. Maybe he was just so embarrassed that the entire world didn't believe his PR attempt that he's just kind of ashamed at his reporting abilities. <laughs> Maybe yeah. he is writing it, but he's going to do it in third person so he can avoid more censure. He could, yeah, he could just be one of those people that refer to himself in third person all the time, and that's just how he, like, talks naturally. Yeah. It's like, I, I know about a guy who went through this, and <laughs> this is my friend's diary. Yeah, yeah, and it's kind of funny, I mean, I guess some people I've talked to, even now, like, have a person preference, like, they, they won't read something in first person, they don't like it, mm -hmm. and... I don't know. To me, it was always like whatever serves best, right? Like sometimes yeah. that's suggested, mm -hmm. sometimes it's not suggested. And it just whatever works best for your narrative always works best for me. Yeah. The first time I actually remember, and I've, I've talked about this on the podcast before, but Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court is a book that I became familiar with when I was really, really young. My dad actually read me that book, and I didn't really understand a lot of it, but I kind of got the gist of it. And I read it again, like, at least two or three times since then. So it's a book I'm pretty familiar with. But that was the first, actually the first time I clearly remember reading or hearing something read that was in first person. Mm -hmm. And and I kind of thought to myself at first, oh, that's weird. And then I thought, you know, it makes sense. It works to tell a story this way. And you wouldn't think that it was a big deal. And now I don't. But it seems like some people, they don't take a shine to that. <laughs> For whatever reason, they don't want a story to be told that way. And I guess point of view is some people are very stiff and rigorous about what they prefer and i don't know if there's not a lot of first person i think the the only thing that is and it's totally unnecessary is the stone because that's a character that doesn't need to be there right you know that's like yeah. the, the only case of first person we have this episode and yeah it's like kind of uh, you know it's it's like that whole thing was handled very badly so at least here williamson kind of he at least seems to know what he's doing, but I just kind of, I kind of wanted to picture it more like there was so much talent there, like in evidence. And I just kind of wanted to see like more of that, more of the reporter's thoughts, more Bill being like the narrator, even though it wasn't his story. I mean, when you read the story, you actually see that Bill actually saves the day on a number of occasions because he shoots off some rockets at like the key points, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I enjoy a good narrator and framing, and I guess the way he initially yeah. phrased it of, like, Bill is an unimportant part of the story, you kind of get the sense that, oh, maybe it's going to be like a Tom Jones, Vanity Fair type thing, where the narrator <laughs> is definitely, like, an important part of the story, but he doesn't factor into the plot at all. He's just giving you, like, his commentary and opinions on, you know, the stuff that's happening as it's happening. Mm -hmm. But that's not, yeah. that's a, not really what's happening here. Yeah. No, no. Yeah, I thought the same thing, where he wasn't really going to impact the story, but he does do a lot for the story and drives it, it forward. Yeah, pretty quite significantly, actually. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, the thing is, if he had been the first-person narrator, he wouldn't have had to. Like, he could have just sat on the sidelines and, and talked about everything, but he's not. So he's like, this Bill... I don't know, it's just, it's just weird the way, <laughs> it, the way it was handled. But again... In his autobiography, Williamson talks so much about his writing process, and he talks about, like, struggling with a lot of things, and struggling with a lot of how to tell a story, and it's very interesting seeing it so candidly done. It's so... I really didn't know what I was doing, but I tried so hard to get it right, and he talks so much about getting rejections, and being like, how can I fix this story to make it good? And he never says at any point, like, he just comes off very, very unpretentious. And it's very funny considering that essay he did about, like, science fiction and stuff. I guess that sounds pretentious, but it sounds more like a speechwriter for the space program or something like that. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's, it's sort of over the top, but he, he's just doing it because he's really excited and he knows that's what his audience wants. And, like, certain things, like, he didn't, he didn't actually understand amazing's money problems like uh, and he he kind of said like he thought that amazing was filling such an obvious void that like people should be all over that and should they should be like yeah this is awesome we need this in our lives the whole idea of science fiction being this kind of trashy thing like he acknowledged it was real it was like something that never occurred to him until he got into the academic world and started to see what people really thought about it and that, like, it was kind of frowned upon. And, you yeah, know, right. Kind of like, gee, really? Mm -hmm. Like, 
<laughs> so, yeah. And there's there's funny things about the phrases that he uses. Like, he talks about electric motors whirring silently. Like, you know, that's the kind of... There's some silly prose here. It's got a charm to it. It's definitely got a charm to it. Mm -hmm. I didn't really mind. And I liked his future visions of what the future would be like. Like, he, yeah, like, okay, the two-mile skyscraper might be a bit much, but generally his New York is like... He makes a point of saying... Yeah, there's a lot of stuff happening. It's pretty busy, but it's clean. There's no pollution. Like, we've done away with that now. It's the golden city, right? Which he mentions in his editorial. It's like, smokeless and unpolluted. It's very Baroque futurism. I mean, he incorporates a lot of details in here. <laughs> yeah. And there's all that, another trope, the MacGuffin mineral, like the magic minerals that can do anything. Yeah, right. The Vitalium. <laughs> he talks about, and I kind of skipped over a lot of his stuff because there was so much of it, but there's a lot of like, and it's not too annoyingly done, but he'll stop the story to talk about something like Vitalium, which is this stuff of life that was discovered at one point, and it's linked with vitamins, and it's somehow this essential substance that controls life and the universe, and it's like... Very powerful, and it can store sunlight energy, but, like, with a million times the power of a solar battery. And it's, like, clean energy. It's perfect, because it's a clean energy battery, basically, fed by the sun. And it provides most of the world power. It's, like, this giant solar battery that can be used again and again. That's, like, a very common sci-fi trope. I think. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Plenty of techno babble in the story in general, more than we've seen in a little while. Of course, everybody smokes in space. <laughs> they do it in the stone story, too. They're always, like, lighting up in the rockets and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, especially in your last moments, what you really need is a, oh, a yeah. nice smoke. Yeah. Well, that was different. That was a very operatic moment. They were, like, sitting in the desert. And, like, they're just, like, they're all manacled up and, like, struggling to get their smokes out. And being like, yeah. You know, I guess this is it, guys. And, hey, Prince, what do you think of that Paula? And, you know, and then he starts singing a song. And it's like <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting, too, how stuff that we take for granted now, like force fields and stuff, are described in weird detail, like they're brand new, basically. I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah, definitely a lot different when the concepts are just being introduced versus when they've been written about for 50, 60 years or whatever. Another thing I thought that was kind of cool was that in this story, even though, I mean, it's pretty ridiculous with the characters and the ending's kind of dumb and all that, but, like, the heroes really get dirty during this. They get bashed up a lot and they get, like, you, you kind of believe that something bad might happen. Yeah. This is a difficult thing to achieve in a pulp story sometimes. Like, even if something like the Conan stories, you're kind of always like, well, Conan's going to come out on top, right? So that's why some of my favorite stories in the Conan series are stories where, like, Conan's not really the main character and he's kind of coming in on the sidelines and he's, like, important in the story, but the story is told from somebody else's point of view and you don't really know if he's going to survive or not. And it's like, yeah, that it kind of adds a little bit of extra power to it, I think. And this here, it doesn't have that, but it's like they really do go through the ringer and yeah i mean bill gets knocked out on yeah. multiple occasions he's like knocked unconscious and losing oxygen almost dying of hypothermia a lot of things yeah. happen to them i mean the moon patrol like gets completely wiped out almost immediately like they're totally yeah. useless yeah so it's not like the ultimate weapon thing is a trope that got used unfortunately pretty often enough in some of these stories like the ee e. doc smith's uh, stories are the ones that I've read, which admittedly is not too many, they all have something like that. And it's really annoying. Like, it's like something that doesn't come up through the whole story. And then, in like, in the last, very last scene, the captain looks at somebody and he's like, well, you better open the cupboard and pull out the Gorgonator blaster unit. And so he does. And then they use it. And, you know, it's like, <laughs> I don't know. This story has a bit of that and Jack was pretty honest about it. Like, it's kind of not that great, but at least I guess they talked about building it and stuff. Like it was something they had to kind of struggle to get. So it earned its place a little bit. And I liked that there was all this like busy activity around it, and math being done and Paula doing all this stuff on a, you can probably picture this like big calculating machine and like probably spooling out paper or something like that. Right. Yeah. 
<laughs> doing like integral calculus or something like that. Just like, yeah, I don't know. But Paula was a real downside to this for sure. She was, uh, her suicide attempt at everything is just like, I don't know, are we supposed to like this character? I, I don't yeah, know. I don't know. It was dumb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I, I liked it overall. It stuck in my head. It stuck in my head and there were things about it that I, I quite respected, I think. Yeah, no, it's fun. It didn't overstay its welcome. And again, surprisingly <laughs> modern. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like it's still, yeah, again, it doesn't overstay its welcome. And it's quite a easy read, so it's, yeah. even with its flaws, it's still, I thought, I still had a good time reading it, and it didn't find it a slog. Yeah. It does have to be said that the work doesn't entirely stand on its own, in my case, like, knowing what Williamson was, and I hope that some of the quotes that I delivered kind of just sort of show how he really tried to think about things and and like advance with the times and stuff like that and he wasn't afraid to mingle with the new generation even though he felt like sort of unaccepted sometimes and he actually has a lot to say about science fiction criticism in the 70s which is when it really started to happen apparently brian aulis actually demolished the legion of space in one of his articles so here williamson talks about being friends with a couple of the big sci-fi critics of the time and he talks about aldous butteries and he talks about Aldous, and he says, I like Brian Aldous, I consider him a friend. I don't know. Maybe they weren't really friends, maybe they were, but like, who knows? They obviously knew each other anyway. But Brian wrote this thing, and we talked about Brian before. He wrote The Trillion Year Spree, which was formerly called The Billion Year Spree, and the first edition was, I think, back in the 70s, and it was like, it's considered a pretty early work in terms of serious criticism of the science fiction genre. And he actually wrote an article demolishing the Legion of Space and Williamson's like, well, it was half the length of the novel. And he said, it felt like somebody took a sledgehammer to a gnat. Like, it was very excessive, he thought. And, you know, he kind of admitted, well, I wrote the story. And even though it's from the 1930s, I still feel kind of personal about it, maybe. And maybe it bothered me more than it had to. But he was kind of like, you know, it's a bit much to take these kind of stories and and dissect them and like he, he said it was like taking an excessive weapon to something that didn't really deserve that kind of treatment and he's kind of hurt by it i guess a little bit but like kind of able to see well that's the way academics work sometimes and people get really into this stuff and i think somebody like brian aldis is like so much a part of the new wave which is kind of going against the whole trend of the space operas and the space westerns and you know we can't forget that aldous himself had nothing good to say about amazing and he thought that the magazine was crap and he basically thought that it held science fiction back for like 20 years or something like that like he had nothing good to say about it but williamson himself did write a number of letters to the magazine and i think maybe now is as good a time as any to get into some of the letters But his first letter was written in October 1927 when he was 18 and signed John S. Williamson. And here he expresses surprise that the magazine doesn't pay for itself. as It seems to be filling an obvious void. And he wants more illustrations on better quality coated paper inside, preferably in color. He wants to see the machines. In this letter, he talks about reading War of the Worlds in the August issue. Not sure if it was for the first time, but he praises it highly. And he closes it with, It requires considerable effort to visualize a new machine, or a strange creature, from words alone. And a good picture vastly increases the clearness of the mental perceptions of such a thing. So it would still be desirable to have at least a half-page illustration of stories involving such. This suggestion may be worthless, but I think most of your readers would approve it. And he goes on to say he hopes that the magazine lives long and flourishes. As well as that, a year later, in October 1928, he writes some constructive criticism. And here he shows that he disagrees with H.G. Wells' notion of the fourth dimension being a plane lying alongside the three known dimensions. And he also speaks up for Frank Paul, calling his illustrations fascinating and wonderful. And here's where he takes up the idea, perhaps proposed by Gernsback or someone else, like Sloan, that they have a science club perform monthly experiments at some member's laboratory. 
with the results published, and he suggests a few reprints, including Merit's The Ship of Ishtar. He's definitely not the only one calling for Abe, and Poe's The Narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym. Now, in June 1929, Jack Williamson styles himself a reader who wants short stories, and he gently complains about some of the serials, especially. <laughs> and here's what he says. I think many of the tales you publish are unnecessarily long, being extended beyond the length required by the plot or the theme, for no other reason that I can see than to increase the size of the author's check. This does not mean that I do not like novels. The Moon Pool is at once the longest and the best story that I have read in Amazing Stories. I object to the extension of a short story to novel length without a corresponding increase in the interest of the story. The King of the Monkey Men, the Elf Man, Ten Million Miles Sunward, the Golden Girl of Mundan, and Armageddon 2419 are some of the worst offenders in this respect. Any of them would have had a much greater intensity of interest if the length had been reduced to half, and if a little attention had been paid to unity of impression and the creation of a single narrative effect. The best short stories you have published meet the requirements set forth above. They include the stories of Miles J. Brewer, The Color Out of Space, The People of the Pit, The Malignant Flower, and most of the stories of H.G. Wells and Francis Flagg. I hope you follow Mr. Brewer's suggestion of publishing literary stories, perhaps offering occasional prizes for literary science fiction stories, limited, say, to 5,000 words. He got a kind of a snippy editorial reply to that as well as his request for color pictures, basically saying that would be way too expensive. And we don't want to increase the cost of the magazine. A lot of those editorial remarks were kind of sarcastic and snippy to the readers. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and that's common. I mean, you yeah, see that right. every now and then. But yeah, I don't know. It's, it's kind of funny. But yeah, he mentions Armageddon 2419, and I wanted to slip that in there somewhere. Buck Rogers is a very famous character, and he was actually first to be found in that story, Armageddon 2419 right. by Francis Mowen, I think his name was, mm -hmm. which I think is from 1926 or 27. I didn't write it down, but so this story, we're kind of choosing an interesting path of deciding what to go on to the Chrononauts podcast. Like we picked Mina Irving and we picked other stuff sometimes in our podcast, not necessarily the most known. And we're not picking Buck Rogers because, not because... I don't necessarily enjoy what Buck Rogers became. I mean, I haven't spent a lot of time watching this show or anything like that, but the story is really, really racist. So it is like unpleasantly so. And just kind of interesting because most people don't know that the origin of Buck Rogers is like this really, really hardcore yellow peril kind of story. Hmm. But yeah, that's kind of the case. And, and it is long and it is very tedious. So I happen to have read most of it. Uh, I think I ended up skimming through a lot of it just to see what happened. But anyway, so I'm glad we're not doing that on the podcast. But I would say he mentions actually two stories in this letter, which are probably the most famous stories in Amazing, really, which would be that one and H.P. Lovecraft's The Color Out of Space. Right. Which that's to this day one of Lovecraft's most famous stories. And it was not initially published in Weird Tales. So that's kind of interesting. I really don't have anything else to add about The Prince of Space. I think that was quite an epic. And unless you guys have anything else to say, I think it's time to move on to the so-called queen of the space operas. Mm -hmm. 